this is Harsh Rules. I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to continue to learn to play Star Wars Imperial Assault. Star Wars Imperial Assault was released in 2014 and supports up to five players. Imperial Assault is published by Fantasy Flight Games and designed by Justin Kimpainen, Corey Kanishka, and Jonathan Ying. A typical scenario takes from one to two hours to play. In the last episode, we learned the game's basic rules and played through a simple tutorial. In this episode, we're going to learn Star Wars Imperial Assault's campaign rules. The campaign rules add a much greater level of complexity to the game. So it's imperative that you understand those basic rules before you proceed onward and play linked missions in a campaign. The campaign rules give Star Wars Imperial Assault a much stronger RPG feel. In the campaign rules, you can earn experience to unlock additional abilities for your characters and accumulate credit that you can use to purchase new items. This style of gameplay, like typical RPGs, is very story focused. Now, while I'll be teaching you the campaign rules, I'm going to do my best not to spoil any of the storylines so you can enjoy it on your own. So without further ado, let's jump in and learn how the campaign structure works. This is the Imperial Assault Campaign Guide. Inside this guide, you'll find all the information you need to play the game's missions. First though, I want to draw your attention to the back of the guide. On the back of the campaign guide is an Imperial Assault campaign log. This campaign log allows players to keep track of the various missions and the outcomes. The core campaign is divided into 11 mission slots. These 11 mission slots are divided between 6 story mission slots and 5 side mission slots. Also note that there are some critical pieces of information that can only be found on the campaign log. The Imperial Threat Level for each mission and side mission, and which tier of item decks are available in the Rebel Upgrade phase. Take some time to familiarize yourself with the campaign log as it is essential to playing through a campaign. Now let's look at the campaign structure in greater detail. First, we're going to learn how a Star Wars Imperial Assault campaign is structured. I'll cover off on each of these sections in greater detail later, but for now, let's absorb how these pieces all interact with each other. You'll begin the core campaign with an introductory mission called Aftermath. Aftermath is located on page 4 in the campaign guide. Each mission, whether it be a side mission or a story mission, has a threat level. The Imperial player uses threat to deploy his or her forces. The threat number grows as you continue farther into the campaign. For the introductory mission, Aftermath, the threat level is 2. At the end of a mission, Rebel heroes may earn rewards, credits, and experience. The Imperial player may earn rewards, influence, and experience. Once you've completed Aftermath, you will enter an Upgrade phase. During an Upgrade phase, each side can purchase new items and abilities for their characters. The Upgrade phase is divided into two parts. The first part is the Upgrades for Rebel Heroes. During the Rebel Upgrade phase, the players can use their experience to purchase new abilities from their class decks. Next, they can use any credits they've earned to purchase new items. Each upgrade phase has a specific item deck that can be drawn on to purchase new items. The first few upgrade phases have the Tier 1 item deck. Later upgrade phases will offer Tier 2 and Tier 3 item cards. The second half of the upgrade phase is for the Imperial side. The Imperial player can use the experience they've earned to purchase new abilities from their class card deck. 
and they can use the influence they've earned to purchase cards from their agenda deck. Agenda cards allow the Imperial player to unleash powerful abilities and set up special missions. Once the upgrade phase is complete, it's time for the Rebel heroes to select a side mission. Side missions are tracked with the side mission cards. The side mission deck is composed of a select number of side mission cards. A red personal side mission for each hero in play. Four green mission cards selected by the hero players. And four random gray side mission cards. These cards are all shuffled together to form the side mission deck. Two side mission cards are drawn from this deck and the heroes can choose one of them to play. Side mission spots in the campaign also have threat levels. The threat level for this side mission is 2. After completing the side mission, both sides will collect their awards. Then the players will enter another upgrade phase. At this point in the campaign, the Imperial player may have earned enough influence to purchase a Force mission from his or her agenda deck. Force missions interrupt the normal campaign flow and must be completed by the heroes before progressing on. The players will then proceed to the next story mission, Mission 1. At the conclusion of the introductory mission, Aftermath, if the heroes won, then a mission opens up along the hero path. If the Imperials won the mission, then the next mission that will open up will be along the Imperial path. Missions in the campaign are tracked with the story mission cards. The Imperial threat level for mission 1 is 3. Upon completion of mission 1, the players will collect their awards. They will then proceed on to the next upgrade phase. So this outline takes us from the introductory mission all the way through to the end of Mission 1. Now we're going to break down each of these sections to learn how to play through them. So let's go back to the beginning and set up the first introductory mission, Aftermath. Once we have Aftermath set up as reference, this will give us an opportunity to learn the additional campaign rules. So. Get your bits together, people. It's time to set up the game. To set up the first mission, you're going to need the following tiles. A quick note, make sure you get two 36B tiles for this setup. So here we go. Let's set up the board one tile at a time. First, you're going to place tile 22B. Next, to the left, you're going to place 36B. On the right side, you're going to place 32B. Below this, you're going to place 25B. To the right, you're going to place 36B. And on the left side of 25B, you're going to place 35B. To the left of this tile, 28B. Then 7A. Above this, 10A, and finally, 18A. And that's all the base tiles we need to set up for Aftermath. Now that we have the floor plan laid out, let's place the secondary markers. This level has one door token, which we place here. There are three crate tokens, one in 7A, one in 22B, and one in 25B. Finally, there are four terminal markers. Two in 22B, one in 25B, and one in 7A. Next, we're going to place the Imperial figures. Place three stormtroopers in the following location on tile 7A. Also on tile 7A, you're going to place one Imperial probe droid, here. Then you're going to place an Imperial officer on tile 28B. Finally, you're going to place the entrance marker on 10A. The entrance marker tells the Rebel hero players where to place their figures. 
When playing Star Wars Imperial Assault, the Imperial player acts as a semi-game master. The Imperial player is privy to all the information in the campaign guide, and they slowly reveal this information to the Rebel hero players. Therefore, from here on out, much of this information is only for the Imperial player to reveal to the Rebel players. So keep that in mind as we proceed through the tutorial. Now, let's collect the necessary cards for the play area. First, we're going to prepare the cards from the Imperial Deployment Deck. Deployment cards can be assigned to three categories in a mission. First is the Initial Group. These deployment cards are for figures that are already on the board. The Initial Groups for Aftermath include a Grey Imperial Officer, a Grey Stormtrooper, and a Grey Probe Droid. The second category is Reserve Deployment Groups. These deployment cards and figures are held in reserve until the mission tells you to place them on the board. For Aftermath, the reserve groups are a Grey Imperial Officer, a Grey Stormtrooper, and a Grey E-Web Engineer. Finally, we have Open Groups. These are deployment cards that are selected by the Imperial player that can be placed with threat. The campaign guide will dictate how many of these open groups you get per mission. Aftermath does not have any open groups, but to give you an idea, the average is about three per mission. With open groups, you can use deployment cards from either the Empire deployment deck or the Mercenary Deployment Deck. The only exception is if the title on the card has a block before it. Block deployment cards are usually unique characters reserved for certain missions. Now remember, you want to keep your reserved deployment card group secret from the Rebel players. Also, if you're playing a mission with open groups, you want to keep these cards secret from the Rebel player as well. Finally, for the Imperial side, find the Imperial class deck with the Stormtrooper on the card back. There are other Imperial class decks to choose from, but we'll use this one for our example. Search through the cards until you find one named Show of Force. This is the Imperial player starting card for their class deck. Next, find the Hero class card deck for each hero that's going to be taking part in the mission. For this example, I'm just going to use Jen O'Don and Diala Pasil. Obviously, there can be up to four heroes, and they can be any combination of the available heroes. Find each character's signature weapon card in the deck. Hang on to all these cards, because we're going to place them in the play area. Now we're going to set up the play area. On the left side is the Imperial area. First, place the Threat and Round dial. Next, place your three active Imperial Deployment cards. Remember, these are the Deployment cards that already have figures on the map. Then, place your deck of secret Imperial Deployment cards. These are for the reinforcements. Next, place your Imperial Class deck and the starting card. On the right side is the Rebel Hero area. Place each hero card, their signature weapon card, and an activation token with the green side up. Also place each hero's remaining class card deck. Next, place the crate card deck, and set up your token pool and dice. Now we have Aftermath set up and we're ready to learn the new campaign rules. Now, we're going to take a look at the basic mission structure. The majority of the new campaign rules are for the Imperial player. Remember, the Imperial player is the only person privy to the contents of the campaign guide. Not only do they play the game, but they're also a semi-game master. 
With that said, let's crack open the campaign guide and go to page 4 for the Aftermath mission. The first thing to point out is the information you need to set up the mission. You have a visual representation of what the mission looks like when it's set up. There's a list of the tiles you'll need to put the mission together. And finally, here's the information for the Imperial deployment. This section shows you the initial groups that you'll place on the board, the reserve groups that'll be played throughout the mission, and if there are any eligible open groups. I use this information to set up the mission earlier. Now let's look at the mission itself. Each mission has a set structure. First the Imperial player reads the mission briefing to set the stage. Gameplay begins and at certain times players will trigger events that move the story forward. These events dovetail into the end of mission sequence. If the Rebel heroes achieve their objectives, then the Imperial player reads the Rebel ending. The Rebel player receives rewards for their success, and the next story mission card is revealed. If the heroes fail to meet their objectives, then the Imperial player reads the alternate ending with the Imperial victory. In this case, the Imperial player receives the rewards and reveals the next story mission card. Finally, there may be an additional reward sequence where each side gets a little extra something. And that's the layout for a typical mission. A quick reminder on the mechanics of mission structure from the previous episode. A round of play is divided in two phases. In the activation phase, Rebel and Imperial players will take turn activating figures and taking actions. When all the figures have been exhausted, you move into the status phase. The status phase ties up loose ends from the activation phase and prepares for the next round of play. During the status phase, you will advance the round dial by one, increase the threat dial by the threat level, ready exhausted cards, deploy and reinforce units, and resolve any end of round effects. Next, we're going to talk about Imperial Threat and Deployment. Each mission, whether it's a story mission or a side mission, has a threat level. The threat level for the introductory mission, Aftermath, is 2. As the campaign progresses, the threat level increases from mission to mission. To understand the concept of threat, we need to start with the threat and round dials. At the beginning of each mission, the round dial is set to 1. The threat dial is set to 0. When the players take their turns and alternate between the Rebel side and the Imperial side, this forms the turn sequence. When all the figures have been exhausted, this comprises one round of play. When a round of play is completed, we move the round dial to the next number up. After we've adjusted the round, then we address the threat dial up by the threat level. In this case, we would move the threat dial to number 2. So whenever you complete a round of play, you increase the round dial by 1 and you increase the threat dial by the threat level. So now that we know how threat is generated, let's learn how the Imperial player uses threat for deployment. As we saw earlier, you use threat to bring open deployment groups into the game. The best way to learn how to use threat with deployment cards is with the Stormtrooper card. On the Stormtrooper card, the symbol to the left tells you how many figures are associated with this deployment. The statistic in the upper left hand corner tells you the threat deployment cost. If this deployment of gray stormtroopers is not represented on the board, then you pay the deployment cost to bring them onto the board. The smaller stat next to this tells you the threat reinforcement cost. If one of your stormtrooper figures on the board is eliminated, 
then you pay the reinforcement cost to bring a replacement figure onto the board. Some quick notes. You can never have more figures on the board than is allowed by the group limit symbol on your deployment card. So in this example, no matter how much threat you have, you cannot bring more than three Stormtrooper figures onto the board for this deployment card. Second key note. If all the figures are eliminated, then the deployment is completely removed from the game. Once you've lost your last figure, the deployment is gone. You cannot use threat to bring it back into the game. Now that we know how threat is generated and how to deploy figures, the question is where do you deploy them? The answer is there are set deployment points for each mission identified in the campaign guide. These deployment points are secret and are not to be shared with the Rebel player. Let's look at the various deployment points for Aftermath. At the beginning of the mission, the Imperial player can only deploy figures at green deployment points. As the mission progresses and events are triggered, additional colored deployment points will open up. For example, red deployment points and yellow deployment points. These new deployment points are usually to bring the reserve figures onto the board. As the Imperial player, keep these various points in mind as you deploy your figures to stop the rebel heroes. Certain missions call for the use of massive figures. Massive figures may take up several spaces on the board. Due to their size, massive figures have additional rules. Because they tower over other figures, those figures do not block their line of sight. They can also enter spaces containing hostile figures and difficult terrain at no additional cost. They can end their movement in spaces with blocked terrain or other figures. Those figures get pushed to the closest empty space. If there are multiple empty spaces available, then their player can decide which space they get pushed into. However, there are also some drawbacks to massive figures. They can't enter spaces with other massive figures. And they cannot enter interior spaces on the map. Keep these rules in mind if the mission calls for the use of a massive figure. Next, let's take a look at how upgrade phases function. Following a mission, each side may receive rewards for their efforts. The Rebel player receives experience and credits. The Imperial player receives experience and influence. Some players may receive item-based rewards throughout the mission or afterwards. There are formal awards through reward cards. Throughout the mission, players may loot crates for crate cards. Also, any crate markers picked up during the mission are worth 50 credits at the end of the mission. The time to use the currency-based points like experience, credits, and influence is during the upgrade phase. The upgrade phase is divided into two parts. First, the Rebel player conducts their upgrade phase. The Rebel player uses experience points to purchase additional abilities from his hero class card deck. Earned credits are used to purchase items from the available tier item card deck. The second half of the upgrade phase is for the Imperial side. The Imperial player also uses experience to purchase abilities from his Imperial class card deck. Influence is used to purchase abilities and missions from the agenda card deck. Now let's look at how an upgrade phase works using Aftermath as an example. For the Aftermath mission example, these are the decks that are currently in play. The Rebels have hero decks for Jen O'Don and Diala Pasil. Following the introductory mission, the Tier 1 item card deck is available. The Imperial player has selected the Imperial class card deck, Military Might. And of course for influence, we have the Agenda card deck in play. 
Now, an additional level of complexity to this game is that during an upgrade phase, not all the cards in these decks are available. During an upgrade phase, for the Hero Class card decks, all cards are available for purchase. However, for the available item card deck, you draw six cards off the top of the deck and that represents the shop that you can purchase from. The Imperial player may purchase all cards available from their chosen Imperial class card deck, in this instance Military Might. For the available Agenda cards during the upgrade phase, you draw four cards off the top of the Agenda deck. Now let's look at each of these card sets in greater detail so we understand how they work. In the tutorial episode for Star Wars Imperial Assault, we covered the Hero Class cards, but here's a brief reminder. This is Jen O'Don's Class Card Deck. Each class deck has a signature weapon or a free starting card. The remainder of the cards in the class deck must be purchased with experience. The experience cost for each of these class cards can be found in the lower left hand corner. When these cards are purchased, place them next to your hero card so you know the extra abilities you can tap into. These are all the available cards in the Tier 1 item deck. Remember, the Tier 1 item deck is shuffled and only 6 of these cards will come up during an upgrade phase. The credit cost for each of these items is in the lower left hand side of the card. Since these item setups are more or less shops, you can also sell items that you have. Just be aware if you sell an item that you have to the shop, it's 50% of the listed credit price. There are also other icons on the card to be aware of and how they interact with each other. These icons in the center of the card identify whether the item is a weapon, armor, or equipment. When equipping your hero, be aware there are limits on the number of items each hero can have. Heroes can have one armor item, two weapon items of either ranged or melee weapons, and three equipment items. Now you'll notice that some cards have what looks like a weapon icon with a little arrow pointing up. These item cards are called modifications. They modify the weapon type listed on the icon. For example, the Marksman Barrel modifies a ranged weapon. At the bottom of a weapon card, you'll notice two arrows pointing down. These represent the number of modifications that can be added to that weapon. Now you can see how the item cards can interact with each other as well as the hero card. Imperial class cards fall into three groups in the core game. Subversive Tactics, Technological Superiority, and Military Might. Each of these class decks offer abilities that complement particular play styles. Subversive tactics use abilities that exploit the enemy's weakness and are oppressive. Technological superiority obviously focuses on tech abilities. Military might is all about brute force. For example, this is the Imperial class deck Military Might that we selected for our Imperial player in our Aftermath example. Just like the Rebel class deck, the Imperial class deck has a starting card at no cost. The remainder of the class cards must be purchased. The cost and experience to purchase each of these cards is listed in the lower left hand corner. Each of these cards that can be purchased fall under the theme of Military Might. At the beginning of the game, the Imperial player selects six Agenda card sets to shuffle together to form the Agenda deck for the campaign. The core game comes with the first six sets. For the right price, Retaliation, Agents of the Empire, Imperial Industry, Imperial Discipline, and Imperial Security Bureau. Each agenda card set is comprised of three cards. The influence cost of each agenda card is listed in the lower left hand corner. 
Four of these agenda card sets have missions that can be purchased. We'll cover off a little more on these during the side mission phase. Once you add agenda card sets from expansions, then you can be more selective in crafting your agenda card deck. Once you shuffled your six sets together and formed your agenda card deck, you draw four cards and keep them secret from the Rebel player. You can use influence to purchase from these four cards during the upgrade phase. Now, let's look at the mechanics of how side mission stages work. Side missions are divided into three groups. Red side missions, green side missions, and gray side missions. Each of the side mission cards is laid out in a similar fashion. Near the top is the name of the side mission and the location in the Star Wars universe it takes place at. The text in the center of the card introduces the side mission and points out where it's located in the campaign guide. At the bottom of the card, you will find the reward that the heroes earn for completing that particular side mission. Now let's walk through the specifics of each colored side mission. Red side missions are specific to characters participating in the campaign. For example, this is the Temptation side mission for Diala Pasil. On the right side of the card, you can find a character identifier that tells you the specific hero that this side mission is tied to. Green side mission cards are chosen by the heroes at the beginning of the campaign. The Rebel hero players must collectively decide which four green side missions to choose. In the core set, there are only four green side missions. However, as you build out your Star Wars Imperial Assault collection, you'll receive more green side missions to choose from. On the right side of the card, you'll see a time period identifier. Each expansion has an associated time period. The core set's time period is 3. As you add expansions, certain green side missions may or may not be eligible for that expansion. Finally, there are gray side mission cards. At the beginning of the campaign, you will shuffle the gray side mission cards together and randomly draw four and place them face down in the gameplay area. Now you're going to take each of these side mission cards and shuffle them into a side mission deck. You will then draw two side mission cards from this deck and place them face up in the play area. These cards represent the available side missions that can be played during a side mission stage. The heroes may select one of these side missions to play per side mission stage. Once the side mission is chosen, then you draw another card from the side mission deck and place it face up to replace it. In that way, there are always two available side missions to choose from during each side mission stage. Once the Imperial player has enough influence, they may purchase side missions to place into the campaign. These side missions fall into two categories. The first is timed side missions. A timed side mission is placed next to the available rebel side missions. These side missions represent special events that if complete will greatly aid the Imperial player. If the rebel hero selects this Imperial side mission, then they have a chance to stop the Imperials from succeeding. If the Rebel heroes ignore this side mission and complete another side mission, then the Imperial player succeeds and receives a reward. This time side mission card is then removed from the game. The second category is Force side missions. Force side missions interrupt the campaign and force Rebel heroes to play them. Force missions are resolved between campaign stages. The threat level for a force mission is equal to the threat level of the most recently played mission. And that's how agenda missions work in relation to rebel side missions. 
Throughout this tutorial, we've covered a number of rules for the campaign structure. We've covered the setup and campaign rules for the introductory mission, Aftermath. We've looked at spending rewards of credits, experience, and influence to purchase new items and abilities in the upgrade phase. We've learned to set up and play side missions. And we've learned how force missions can interact with the main campaign flow. And we've learned how the hero's success or failure in one mission can influence the selection of the next mission. And now you should have enough information to play through these early missions and onward through the rest of the campaign. With that said, Star Wars Imperial Assault is a very complex game. If you have questions, post them in the comments section and I'll see if we can get you an answer. And that wraps up this episode for Harsh Rules. On the next episode, we will cover Imperial Assault's Skirmish Rules. Until then, I'm Ben Harsh. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next episode.